For centuries, great religions have preached of sin and punishment, of Satan. The devil is the arch enemy of the human race. And hell. It's a mist of darkness, weeping and wailing. It's a place you do not want to go. Stories of an evil Satan and hell's torment are handed down in scripture. Jesus spoke far more about hell than he did about heaven. Where was the devil in the Garden of Eden? And of course the serpent. But concepts of a fiery underworld watched over by a great beast evolved. Most of what we believe about hell and the devil is not taken from the biblical tradition. Just what is hell? And who is Satan? In recent decades, numerous people have reported near-death experiences. A conscious perceptual experience which takes place during a near-death encounter. Most describe a peaceful journey, being guided through a tunnel bathed in bright light. But a select few have experienced something far more frightening. They claim they have journeyed into a world alive with torment. They believe they have been to hell and back. Anything that you've ever imagined or seen in a horror movie, um, it was worse than that. In 1985, 38-year-old Howard Storm was traveling in Europe when he suddenly collapsed with a perforated stomach. Rushed to the hospital, his condition quickly worsened. And the doctors told me that my life expectancy was about five hours. That night, Howard lost consciousness. As he slipped toward death, Storm believes he left his body. Mysterious voices called out to him, and he followed them into the hallway. There were a number of these people, uh, male and female, all adults, and um, very difficult to see them. They immediately encircled me. They were getting closer, and it was getting tighter as we went into this increasing darkness. And I'm like, I'm just completely terrified. So they began to push and pull at me. They were definitely um, trying to elicit pain. What they were doing at first was um, scratching and biting. And then it got much worse. And I had their mouths in me and on me. I was screaming, I was fighting. Although not a religious man, Storm says he called out prayers he had learned as a child in Sunday school. And the people who were around me couldn't bear the mention of God. And they became um, extremely violent and agitated. So I yelled out with everything that I had, Jesus, please save me. And he came to me and touched me and lifted me up and made me whole and filled me with his love and embraced me. Within minutes, Howard Storm was revived and after surgery, he recovered. But his life was forever changed by what he believes he saw. This was like the portal of hell or the entrance to hell. People need to know that they are making their eternal destiny right now, today, at this moment. Death, the great equalizer. People across the globe and throughout time have believed that life endures beyond the grave. Modern religions offer differing concepts of an afterlife, but most are linked by two beliefs. A life lived in accordance with God leads to a positive afterlife, a heaven. A life lived in league with the devil leads to something negative, a hell. Reward and punishment in an afterlife is axiomatic to a belief in a good God. If you believe that God is good, then by definition you believe that there is reward and punishment after this life. But just how will evil be punished? Is hell a physical realm? A state of suffering? Or does it exist at all? 
we all feel guilt and therefore we all need torment and in a sense we all need hell and if we don't believe in it literally we find some way to create it here the bible indicates that the hell is a place because it's a place where god sends the devil and his angels and it's a place where jesus said that those who reject him by faith will one day live hell of course is a metaphor Hell is a mythological concept. What it means is to live without any relationship to God, which is the great gift of uh, human life. Hell may be symbolical in the sense that we are not uh, roasted over fires for eternity or for two minutes for that matter, but the symbolism is, is critical. Most Christian faiths hold that a mighty force both draws us towards evil and watches over hell. This power, this persona, is most often identified as the devil. There's something that, that uh, grasps human freedom and, and, uh, and radically um, corrupts um, people's ability to, to choose good. And, and we call that the devil. We call that the evil one. Over the past 2,000 years, the devil has been depicted as God's great adversary, the one who can lead us to eternal damnation. God is trying to tell us this is what the story of man is all about is the devil is coming to test us and tempt us and try to get us to curse God. God wants people to follow him by choice. He doesn't want robots. He wants us to choose to place our faith in him, to choose to live in obedience to him. And perhaps the devil gives that opportunity for us to make those very hard choices. When every other word, every other complex modern idea fails, we do fall back on the devil because it's the only way we can put into words our horror, our confusion, our uncertainty, our fear. Over time, the devil has been given many names. The beast, the deceiver, the father of all lies and hell has been imagined in countless ways. Those perceptions began to take shape ages ago, in a time before Jesus walked the earth. The hell of fire and brimstone is but the most well-known vision of the netherworld. From Neanderthal man to the 21st century, from the deserts of Mesopotamia to the islands of Greece, humankind has created strikingly similar images of an unpleasant afterlife, portraits of our darkest imaginings. The ancient Egyptians were obsessed by the idea of immortality. They built elaborate tombs to protect the physical body. For any soul to reach the next life, it first had to conquer a gauntlet of terrors, lakes of flames, harsh deserts, ravenous crocodiles. The whole afterlife, according to the Egyptians, was an incredibly complex world that had to be navigated. When a person died, there were seven different gates that a person had to go through just to get to the entrance to the actual afterlife. The Egyptian Book of the Dead listed the secret spells and intricate rituals needed to navigate this supernatural maze. The Egyptians were the first to believe that souls would be judged after death. Those who traversed the underworld came before King Osiris for final judgment. The just were granted eternal life. The unworthy savagely devoured by the hideous monster Amut one of the first depictions of a hellmouth, a gruesome creature who devours the damned. One of the oldest and most pervasive images of hell is the hell mouth. A person doesn't so much go to hell as hell consumes souls. It's not something that they passively go to and are destined to enter, but something that comes up to claim them and take it into its bowels for untold horrors that would lie within. An equally grim fate awaited those who followed the 6th century BC prophet Zoroaster. The religion of Zoroastrianism dominated Europe and the Middle East for nearly 1,000 years. According to its myths, swift and sure judgment of the dead takes place on the razor-thin Shinva Bridge. And this bridge is hazardous. It's very thin. The good person survives the bridge, the walk across the bridge, because their body and their soul are light the 
sinful person or the evil person doesn't because their body is heavy so they tip over and they fall and they fall right into the pits of the fiery hell into eternal judgment Zoroastrianism would soon be dwarfed by the teachings of a new prophet eventually the disciples of Christ the apostle of love would also help define the hell of eternal damnation For many people, their concept of hell is based on one book. The Bible says that hell is a place where people who reject his gracious offer of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ will spend eternity. It's a place of eternal separation from God. Biblical conceptions of hell evolve over the course of the Bible. The Old Testament contains only fleeting and indirect references to hell. Sheol, the Hebrew abode of the dead, is sometimes compared to the gloomy perceptions of modern hell. But in reality, it is quite different. The common destination of both the righteous and the unrighteous dead, Sheol was synonymous with the grave and with separation from God. For Sheol cannot thank you, death cannot praise you, those who go down into the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living, they thank you, as I do this day. Isaiah chapter 38, verses 18 and 19. Sheol is a place where everybody went. It wasn't a matter of reward or punishment. Everybody went there, good or bad. It was just another way of describing what happens to you when you die. The word Sheol does not appear in the New Testament. Instead, the Bible makes reference to Hades. In Greek mythology, Hades is both the name for the ruler of the netherworld and his domain. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. But scholars assign the same meaning to Sheol and Hades, the realm of the dead, not a place of torment. The Bible's first clear reference to a hell of punishment comes in the book of Daniel. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. But not until the New Testament does hell find a home in the Bible. Jesus' ministry turned human eyes away from the earthly and toward a transcendent relationship with God. In the Gospels, Christ proclaims a message of redemption, but also warns of sin's consequence. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Mark chapter 9, verses 47 and 48. Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. And I think implied in there is an urgency to warn people that unless you do something about it, you will be going to hell. Jesus also gives his followers a visual depiction of what hell might be like. Just outside of Jerusalem was Gehenna, a noxious trash dump where refuse was burned. In the Gospels, Christ speaks of Gehenna as a metaphor for the fires that will not cease to burn. The imagery comes from this, this trash heap on the edge of Jerusalem where uh, the, the refuse of Jerusalem was constantly burned. And, and that provided the kind of image um, that has come down through the Christian tradition of hell as a place of smoke and fire and uh, eternal torment. It communicated a thought, the worst possible place, the most painful, a fire that never goes out. It's a terrible place. Although the Bible makes relatively few overt references to hell, its graphic nature is forever emblazoned in several passages. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 13, verse 42. Depart from me, ye cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. 
Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. But for all the torture described in biblical portraits of hell, many theologians hold that the ultimate agony described in the Bible comes from eternal separation from God. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Probably the most basic meaning of hell is separation from God. That really is what it's all about. That's privation. Absence from the presence of God forever. However, some who read scripture literally believe hell is a physical place, with the Bible offering clues to its location. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them. They went down alive into the grave. The earth closed over them. Numbers chapter 16, verses 32 and 33. Hell is located in the, in the middle of the earth, the center of the earth. God created that place for the devil and his angels. Jesus tells us that. Biblical descriptions of hell's agony culminate in a brief notation in the book of Revelation, the apocalyptic story about the end of the world and final judgment. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. I think many of the descriptions of hell in scripture are allegorical. The Bible describes hell as a lake, and a lake is always changing, undulating, never the same, it's not stable. Hell is a place of in enormous instability. We always feel that things are changing and nothing is the same. As biblical concepts of hell were defined, concepts defining codes of conduct that might earn a sentence of eternal damnation emerged in the early centuries. Perhaps none of Christ's followers did more to formulate notions about who goes to hell than the fourth century philosopher Augustine. St. Augustine felt that in order to appreciate the grace of being saved, you had to know that the majority of the people you knew were probably going to damn. Augustine spent his early years in drunken debauchery. Despairing over his misspent youth, he yearned to find meaning in his life. In the Confessions, what St. Augustine says is that I reasoned as far as I could go, and I still couldn't make the jump to religious belief. He's in a state of almost madness, tearing his hair out, running up and down, trying to overcome his lack of religious faith. Finally, while attending his mother on her deathbed, Augustine was convinced by her to convert to Christianity. His conversion was very dramatic for him. He felt that he had performed deeds which should normally have condemned him to hell for all eternity and had distanced him from God. And for no reason that he could justify or ever explain in his life, God came to him with great love and God grace and Augustine was converted. Augustine's subsequent writings combined the zeal of the converted with a love of logical reasoning. He found comfort in devising strict codes to regulate salvation and damnation. He believed such things that that um, unbaptized infants could not ascend to heaven, not because of anything they had done wrong, but because all human beings were born with the original sin from Adam. And until they were baptized, that sin could not be washed away. Augustine played a critical role in making sexual sins one of the most common signposts on the road to hell. Lust requires for all its consummation darkness and secrecy, not only when unlawful intercourse is desired, but even such fornication as the earthly city has legalized. St. Augustine, City of God. It was a bit like someone who'd been a chain smoker, who suddenly um, gave it up and couldn't bear to be in a room with a cigarette again. Um, St. Augustine had a lot of sex before, before he found Christianity, and then suddenly having found Christianity, turned his back on that and became very, very pessimistic about sexuality, very pessimistic about women. Augustine's dark message soon found a ready audience. During the first 1,000 years of Christianity, hell was rarely mentioned from the pulpit. But with the Dark Ages, holy men latched on to Augustine's teachings, 
sometimes to further their own agendas. Where you needed some kind of power, other than guns and rifles, to convince people to follow your way rather than someone else, then hell as a place became more and more real. In a time ripe with famine, plague, and war, most people had no trouble envisioning an equally savage afterlife. Augustine's warnings of the terrors of hell helped to convert pagan masses who lived in the shadow of death. To know that you can wake up and in one week lose your entire family to the plague, and that half of Europe is lost to a plague over a period of four years, this tends to put a whole new perspective on the afterlife. As preachers would constantly tell their congregations, think on death, think on death often. Righteous in their cause, church leaders used the fear of hell to scare souls into pews. And they would go on and on and on about the tortures of it, the misery, the pain, the horrible smell, the unending fire, the, the flesh writhing in agony. Eventually, what they found was that people were coming more to hear the spectacle about hell. It's like going to a good horror movie. You want to be grossed out. You want to be terrified. And the preachers realized that hell was becoming the attraction in itself. For Europeans of the 1500s, hellfire sermons were truth incarnate. We had this sense of hell, and the sense of hell was very real, because all people had was this life in this little town. And this little town only had a church. And that church was your gateway to salvation. And whatever was said in that church was true. The elites are not necessarily gulling the masses when they proselytize about heaven and hell. They're actually telling them what they understand to be the truth. But forceful sermons were not the only tool used to paint portraits of a fiery underworld. Church art and architecture vividly visualize the story of hell. What you can see with your eyes and you can hear through your ear when the sermons are being spoken to you, the hymns are being sung to you, or the scriptures being read to you, come together then in your heart and are emblazoned with you forever. Frescoes favored the abominable fancy, the saved up in heaven, gazing down upon the horrors of the doomed. Many early Christian pictures show people sitting safely up in heaven, looking down as if they were up in the upper balcony at a theater, looking down at sinners being tortured in hell and metaphorically at least rubbing their hands in glee over this. But visions of hell's torture were not complete without a picture of an evil angel to watch over the netherworld. Holy men and authors would elevate the host of hell to dazzling heights of power. For centuries, hell and Satan have been inextricably intertwined. According to the Christian tradition, the devil both watches over hell and entices us to join him there. The quickest path to hell is doing Satan's bidding here on earth. The devil's presence and the devil's temptation give me a choice to do right or to do wrong. A choice to give in to the temptation or to resist it and be obedient to God's word. The devil has many ancestors. Ancient faiths were guided by an array of spirits, angels, ghosts, and goblins. Two deities foreshadowed later imagery of the devil. Seth, the Egyptian crimson god of the underworld, and Pan, the Greek mythological half-man, half-beast with cloven hooves who ruled sexual desire. Perceptions of a modern Satan began to be formed in Bible passages. The Old Testament devil was an enigmatic and minor figure, not an evil mastermind. But early Christians, zealous to spread the word about Christ as the Messiah, used Satan to their advantage. They warned of the devil's wickedness and sought him out in scripture where he had not yet been found. What the, the writers of apocryphal literature did was they started poring over virtually every text in the book of Genesis to try and find evidence of the devil there. In the Hebrew Bible, the snake in the Garden of Eden is simply a snake. That changed. They look at the Garden of Eden 
And they say, well, why did it go wrong for Adam and Eve? Where was the devil in the Garden of Eden? And of course, the serpent. The overt biblical birth of Satan is described in the book of Revelation. Lucifer, the light bearer, is one of God's most beautiful and beatific angels. But his hubris drives Lucifer to challenge God. And the Bible says that Lucifer decided in his heart he wanted to be like God. In fact, he wanted to be God, and he wanted to ascend to the throne. Lucifer and his warrior angels engage the army of God, led by the archangel Michael. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. There was a battle, there was a fight, there was an argument, there was a reckoning. And God said, you can't be up here anymore. I cannot use you as I'll use others, and banished him to earth. Lucifer is joined in exile by his legion of watcher angels, one third of all the stars in God's heavenly court. God grants him dominion over hell, from where he schemes to avenge his fall from grace. He knows he can never be restored to his former greatness. He knows he can never hurt God. But it's like a human being. If you've got a big, strong, beefy neighbor, you might not want to take him on, but when he's not looking, you might kick his dog. When he goes after human souls, he's doing it to try to get even with God. The perception of Satan's ability to lure human souls was enhanced by human beings. In the 6th century, Pope Gregory the Great imbued the devil with sweeping powers by laying the seven deadly sins at his doorstep. If you look at the seven deadly sins, in many ways what Gregory was doing was rejecting the world. So everything that the world liked doing, not working or eating too much or enjoying themselves, and anything worldly, he characterized as the work of the devil. So the seven deadly sins became a means by which the Christian church almost downed the world and set itself up against the world. So everything worldly was, was the work of the devil. Everything otherworldly was the work of God. As the devil's biography was developed, visual portraits of an evil beast were imagined in stone and glass in magnificent cathedrals. The imagery of the medieval cathedral with uh, Satan with his horns and his tail and Satan tempting Eve as a snake wrapped around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. These are all medieval Christian notions, and all of that comes from imagery. By the 10th century, the beast had assumed monstrous form. He dominated religious art, appearing in a thousand grotesque and terrible guises, dressed in black, the color of dark, night, and evil. The devil's color changed during a Renaissance reincarnation. If you are furthest away from God, then you are in the dark. You are not near the light. You are not near warmth. You are in eternal cold. Eternal cold, you are blue. So we begin to see the devil either represented as half human and half animal, or fully animal form, but dark blue. depictions of Satan began to take on characteristics of the Catholic Church's rivals. With the stakes no less than eternal salvation, anyone who opposed the Church was tagged as a friend of Satan. Images of the devil merged with caricatures of Jews with long hooked noses. In the stories of the Gospels, the Jews uh, arrive to doubt the story of the empty tomb, and this is considered demonic. The Jews begin to be symbols for people who doubt the truth of Christianity, and that's why they get demonized. Plagues were blamed on those who traded with the Jews. In 1236, Pope Gregory IX condemned the Talmud, the Jewish holy text, as satanically inspired. Christians, puzzled by the Muslim habit of frequent bathing, dubbed Islamic bathhouses temples to the devil. So everybody is demonized. It's basically the idea that if you're not with us, you're against us. And if you're not in the Christian fold and doing what Christianity wants, you are the servant of the devil. The early church was instrumental in molding perceptions of both Satan and hell. But come the Renaissance, two poets would overcome their personal demons to create a new vision of hell, a vision that lives to this day.
popular imagination has many authors. Most of what we believe about hell and the devil is not taken from the biblical tradition. The Bible doesn't say all that much about it. The details come from our poets, not from our prophets. Most prominent among literary works that help shape our sense of hell is Dante's Inferno. I am the way into the city of woe. I am the way into eternal pain. I am the way to go among the lost. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. The Inferno, Canto 3. Composed by Alighieri Dante in the early 1300s while in exile from his beloved hometown of Florence, Italy, the Inferno was inspired by turbulent events in the author's own life. During Dante's time, the Vatican coveted control over all of Tuscany. Dante, a devout Catholic, believed that the church should share power with civil authorities. While in Rome, he was arrested on a series of bogus charges, including hostility against the Pope. The church threatened his life, confiscated his property, and banished him from his native city never to return. Dante responded by composing the Inferno. Midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself in a dark wilderness, for I had wandered from the straight and true. The Inferno, Canto 1. It's a voyage of the soul. Dante is also a pilgrim. He is going through the entirety of the cosmos, which means that he's also going through the entirety of the soul. Dante's portrait of hell is far more detailed than biblical descriptions. He imagined nine circles of hell, each level designed to imprison souls guilty of specific sins. It started on the uppermost level of hell and described the inferno as nine descending realms with the worst, most vile sinners at the very pit of hell in the ninth realm with Satan himself. Connecting punishment to the severity of sin, Dante graphically described the suffering of the damned. People strip naked and their faces torn with rage. They thumped each other with the head the chest, the feet, the teeth, snapping to rip each other limb from limb. The Inferno, Canto 7. It really hit people on a very different level than just another Hellfire sermon that talked about how bad things were because it equated it with what a person does is directly connected to how he will suffer in the afterlife fortune tellers were said to walk through eternity with their heads sewn on backwards for pretending to see the future which could be known only to God. People who had given in to their passions, people who were adulterers, were swept along eternally by winds because in life they had been swept by their passions. Every sin had a very specific punishment. I set the father and the son at war because I severed two such persons joined. Severed, I carry now my brains, alas, from their stem in this trunk. Thus you may see the rule of retribution work in me. The Inferno, Canto 28. One of the interesting things about the Inferno is that the thing that gets people sent to hell, the thing that's damnable and sinful about them, is the fact that they love, but they love the wrong things. Everyone is in hell because they love. If you love wealth, or sex, or political power, or any of the other possible things that we could love instead of loving God, those are damnable sins. For Dante, the one unforgivable act was betrayal of trust. The ninth and lowest level of hell is occupied by history's greatest traitors, engulfed not in flames, but in an arctic chill that distances them from God's light. If you were the great traitors, like Judas and Brutus and Cassius, you were going to spend eternity being chewed upon in the mouth of this three-headed beast who was immobile, blue, and frozen in the deep, dark coldness of hell, separated from God. Dante placed several church fathers, including Pope Celestine V and Pope Boniface VIII in his lowest circle of hell. Are you standing there already, Boniface? The great priest, may he be dragged to hell. The Inferno, Cantos 19 and 27. 
Dante was exiled from his country, had many enemies, and you find them all in his hell. They're all there being punished with his artistic imagination, just as they deserve to be. The Inferno's impact was profound and immediate. It was read aloud to large assemblies of enthralled listeners. It was quickly translated into every European language. Italian artists discarded time-worn cliches and began painting Dante's hell. What Dante does, he manages to put into narrative a way of thinking about the sublime, a way of thinking about the divine. That all the language of hell is kind of shorthand caricature trying to talk about moral possibility, about what human life might be like. Dante had transcended simplistic views of hell with a grandly metaphorical vision. He transformed hell into an ongoing story of man's struggle to understand the world. Just as Dante forever expanded our notion of hell, English poet John Milton revolutionized the character of the devil. Milton elevated Satan to a champion of the dark side, an immensely powerful force for evil. He's a warlord, and all of the other mafiosi under him are paying tribute to him. His ego is enormous. His individuality is huge. During his college days in the 1620s, Milton dreamt of creating an epic poem on the scale of the Iliad or the Odyssey. But his youthful idealism crumbled under the sorrow of the deaths of his two wives, two children, and an illness that left him blind. Twenty years after losing his sight, Milton battled back to produce his masterpiece, Paradise Lost. The mind itself is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven, Paradise Lost. His insight is opened up and becomes sharpened by his lack of external sight. And his insight is not sight into the world around us, it's sight into his own soul, into his psyche. That's where he finds Satan, and that's where he finds God. Paradise Lost retells the story of Lucifer's fall from heaven. In this version, Satan is a romantic hero brought low by his pride. The story opens with a dramatic landscape of hell. The rebel angels are defeated and demoralized until Lucifer rouses them. Here we may reign secure and in my choice. To reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Paradise lost. Milton kept the idea of him as being an immensely potent, charismatic, outsized figure. The sort of leader that you can understand would bring down a third of the stars from the sky. A third of the angels in heaven followed him down there because he was their leader. A magnificent leader, Milton Satan cannot bring himself to atone to God for leading an insurrection. Satan's loss is somehow powerfully human in a way that God can't be. It's very hard to identify with God in his perfection, but we all know what it's like to have a certain satanic impulse in us. All of us know what it's like to transgress. All of us know what it's like to be stubborn and to refuse to admit that we were wrong. The demons of self-justification are things that almost everyone can identify with. Milton's vision embellished the notion of a powerful Satan in an adversarial role. Throughout time, the devil would engage in epic battles, clashes against both God and man. From the beginning of time, man and God have battled the evil one. One of the earliest biblical examples of the devil standing up to God and testing human faith is found in the book of Job. The book of Job recognizes that there are other forces, other powers that somehow are under God's control, but God is not the cause of evil, even though he's master of the universe. So you have God who's in control of everything, yet not the cause of evil. Satan, who's the tempter, who causes that evil to happen. In scripture, God boasts to Satan of his faithful servant Job's righteousness. 
Satan counters by charging that Job reveres God only because wealth and prosperity have been bestowed upon him. In the book of Job, uh, Satan is a member of the heavenly court who tests human beings. Satan challenges God by stating that if afflicted, Job will denounce the Almighty. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. Job chapter 1, verse 11. Satan is saying if man is only good because he expects a reward. And God says, no, that isn't true. So the devil says, well, let's put them to the test. Satan makes a wager with God. Now, this is profoundly diabolical. I mean, what could be more futile than betting against God? What are your chances of winning? Zero. So why would anyone take such a bet? Only to do evil for evil's sake. God permits Satan to visit Job with a series of shattering catastrophes. The only restriction is that he not physically harm Job. In one day, Job loses all his material possessions. Satan also robs Job of his family. Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. Job chapter 1 verses 18 and 19. Though Job is deeply grieved, he does not curse God, but Satan does not back down. He claims Job will falter if he can inflict harsher treatment. God agrees to the test, with the exception that Job's life be spared. Satan smites Job with boils from head to toe. Finally, Job assails God for his misfortunes. I will say to God, does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands while you smile on the schemes of the wicked? Job chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. In the end, Job repents and pledges full allegiance to God. Satan goes down to the earth and removes these good things from Job, takes away his family, takes away his property, takes away his health, and still Job does not blaspheme. Man has stayed true to the Almighty, but Satan has exposed a fissure that he will forever seek to exploit. There are many lessons to be learned from the book of Job, and one of the lessons is that Satan cannot touch my life except he has God's permission. So when bad things come into my life, and perhaps Satan has orchestrated some of them, then I know that my Heavenly Father has shielded me and protected me, and if he lifts his hand of protection and allows Satan to attack, it's going to be for my own good, and there's a, a better ultimate purpose. While Satan is allowed by God to bring tragedy upon Job, in the book of Matthew, the devil tests the Son of God. While Jesus fasts in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, Satan offers him three temptations, including the most alluring one of all, power. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. We are tempted not with the worst of sins, but with the noblest. We're tempted to take things into our own hands rather than to trust God. Jesus in that time of spiritual isolation, of testing, is tempted to take things into his own hands. Is tempted to use his power to control rather than to serve, to create an empire rather than to be God's son. Jesus refused to take any shortcut. He refused to get the kingdoms of this world, which Satan offered him as the God of this world. He refused any shortcut to the cross. He had to die. After Jesus' death, one Christian text suggests that he descends into hell. The Apostles' Creed, written sometime between the 2nd and 9th centuries, is the most popular creed used in worship by Western Christians. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
On the third day, he rose again. Most scholars interpret the passage to mean that Jesus descends not to battle Satan or deliver the damned, but rather that he journeys to Sheol in order to free the just souls who had gone to the realm of the dead. After his death on the cross, Jesus, in uh, a spiritual sense, went to Sheol to these Old Testament saints to announce to them that the ultimate sacrifice had been made, their sins were forgiven, that heaven was open for them. Over time, Catholic oral tradition expanded the story into the so-called harrowing of hell. One reason the harrowing of hell becomes so important is that Christianity wants to save the Hebrew forefathers. It wants to save Abraham and Isaac especially. It shows Jesus in a role that is very different from anything we actually see in the Bible. We see him not as being a preacher or being crucified in a sort of passive role. We see him really and truly as Jesus Christ's superstar, as Jesus coming down, rescuing people, a very virile, strong image of Jesus. A few biblical passages hint at this story, but none directly supports it. Hence, many Christian denominations have removed the phrase descended into hell from the creed. At no time in the harrowing of hell or in any biblical story is Satan able to control Jesus or God. But can he invade a human being? You know the devil has his claws in you. I came here for that sole purpose to be delivered from all these evil spirits that were inside of me. And if possessed, Come out of her! how does one recover? Satan! Go now! In 1973, the horror movie The Exorcist shocked audiences with its vivid portrayal of satanic possession and exorcism. But notions of demons infiltrating the human body date back throughout time. Some believe concepts of possession originated in prehistoric shamanistic beliefs. Those believed to be shamans drove evil spirits from the bodies of victims of witchcraft. By the 1500s, church leaders, authors, and artists had popularized Satan. Sermons, paintings, books, and plays all confirmed that the devil was everywhere. Leering from the church door, launching wars, lurking in every man's bed. Even Martin Luther, who rejected much of Catholic dogma, believed that demons invaded his body. Martin Luther was the most devil-obsessed man in history. And Martin Luther, it appears, suffered from very bad constipation for most of his life. And um, he believed that was the work of the devil. The devil was there in his bowels. Luther lived in an age when the devil's influence reached its peak. From 1500 to the early 1700s, witch hunts raged across Europe. Neighbor was set against neighbor, husband against wife, as accusations of lust, envy, desperate love, and frustrated desire filled kangaroo courts. Witches were considered to be agents of the devil, and they were everywhere. During the witch hunts, you had a terrible explosion of guilt. People cannot bear to feel too guilty. It torments them. Finally, they can't punish themselves enough, and they have to project that rage on other people and punish it in others. During the Inquisition, 100,000 women were burned at the stake as witches. The great deceiver, the father of all lies, was thought to delight in corrupting the innocent. The more innocent you looked, the more often you went to church, the holier you seemed, well, the more likely it might be that you are an agent of Satan because who would suspect you? You seem so innocent. You seem like someone who would never do this. You are the perfect tool for Satan to use. Soon, new tools were adopted in the never-ending war with Satan. In 1468, Pope Paul II decreed that torture was acceptable in cases of suspected witchcraft. Two years later came the Malleus Maleficarum, one of the most popular books of the age and the unofficial textbook of the Inquisition. 
It emphasized that witches were in league with the devil and offered hints on identifying the guilty. And so if they had stones sewn into their garments and they were thrown into a lake or a pool and they drowned, the understanding was not that the stones had held them down, but their evil deeds had held them down and it was a sign that they were truly witches. Prior to the modern world, politics and religion are not separate. They're the same thing. If there's a disorder in society, it has a religious dimension. They honestly and seriously believe that when something peculiar occurs and it has an adverse impact on society, that somewhere along the line there is some diabolical aspect to this. It's a way of personifying the evil that they experience in the world. When the Puritans journeyed to the New World, they brought old fears. Early Protestantism was, was very, very devil-obsessed. It was also very anti-sex. So when you get to groups like the Puritans, who went over to America and settled in New England, they brought that baggage with them. They were, they were devil-fearers. They saw the devil all around them. One of the most effective at instilling the fear of the devil in his followers was Puritan preacher Jonathan Edwards. His commanding sermon, Sinners of an Angry God, demands all be righteous or face the horrors of hell. There is no want of power in God to cast wicked men into hell at any moment. They deserve to be cast into hell so that divine justice never stands in the way. Justice calls aloud for infinite punishment of their sins. Sinners of an Angry God, Jonathan Edwards. When Jonathan Edwards was preaching Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, why would they go for three days in the snow to listen to this man preach? and what he had was, in effect, their eventual damnation. People like fear. We place ourselves in fearful situations. Fear and terror are primary human emotions. Consumed by fear, the Puritans generated the Salem Witch Scare of 1692. Once again, there was no defense against a charge of collaborating with the evil one. The people doing the questioning in witchcraft interrogation often worked from a prepared set of questions. They knew what the devil did. The Salem scare was small by European standards. Just a score of women tried, condemned, and executed over a single year. The devil seemed to take a vacation for a time. For nearly 300 years after Salem, legal cases involving the devil were rarely seen in American courts. But suddenly, with the satanic ritual craze of the 1980s and 90s, he was back. Hundreds of parents and daycare workers in Britain and the United States were accused of abusing thousands of children in bizarre witches' sabbaths. When supposed victims failed to support allegations, they were said to be in denial. There was a theory put forth that essentially the worse the abuse, the harder the children would struggle to deny it. So, in a sense, the less information you got from the child, the more evidence it was that they'd been abused. But children were not the only alleged victims. Many of the charges were thought to be the result of recovered memory syndrome. If we dig too deeply into our past and we say to ourselves, as in the recovered memory therapy, that all the monsters and all the dreams and all the ghosts we saw as children were actually real, then the demons come out and haunt us. Some therapists drugged and hypnotized adult patients, urging them to probe their memories for signs of childhood abuse at the hands of satanic cults. The media fanned the flames by inflating cult numbers. Hosting a television special on the phenomenon in 1987, Geraldo Rivera estimated that there are one million practicing Satanists in the United States today. But after exhaustive investigations into hundreds of cases, the FBI found little evidence of ritual satanic abuse. No bodies, no blood, no bones, no signs of ceremonial sites. While widespread satanic abuse has been discredited, there are groups that firmly believe in demonic possession and the power of exorcism. Be gone, Satan, inventor and master of all deceit. It's really a prayer for the healing and the liberation of, of this person from some kind of evil force, personal or impersonal, that seems to have a hold of the person. 
The Catholic rite of exorcism is rooted in New Testament accounts of Jesus casting out demons. In the Middle Ages, the practice became more popular. But Catholic exorcism has never been commonplace. In 1999, the Vatican announced a revised rite of exorcism, the first change in the rite since 1614. In the name of Christ, be gone! Still, the new rites of exorcism are almost identical to the old. The primary change is an emphasis on using exorcism only as a last resort, making exhaustive efforts to rule out physical, psychological, and emotional behaviors that might be confused with possession. Exorcisms are a rare event. The 1973 film The Exorcist is based on the Catholic rite of exorcism and as a fairly reliable guide to what church officials look for in possession. In each case, the exorcist must find four types of behavior. A subject who exhibits a superhuman strength, who shows a fierce reaction to holy things, who displays hidden knowledge, and who speaks in languages he or she would not normally know. But I trusted in thee, O Lord, I said, thou art my God. As described in the Catholic rite, exorcisms begin with the sign of the cross and a sprinkling of holy water. A selection of prayers, litanies, and gospels are read aloud. Straighten her will. Let banish from her soul the temptings of the mighty adversary. After these rites are complete, the exorcist places the end of his stole on the neck of the possessed, reveals a crucifix, and traces the sign of the cross upon the forehead. If deemed necessary, the exorcist then commands the devil to leave the possessed person. We command you to leave in the name of God. The ceremony concludes with a prayer and blessing. The entire rite can be repeated. Catholicism is not the only Christian faith to practice a form of exorcism. Jesus name. Rebuke you, Satan, now, and leave him now. Go from his soul and from his mind in Jesus' name. Each week, Pastor Tom Brown, a charismatic evangelical Christian, delivers dozens of souls from Satan's grip at the Word of Christ Church in El Paso, Texas. Leave her now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. There you go. There you go. There. We don't really use uh, the term exorcism. Uh, we prefer the term deliverance or casting out demons. We don't use the word possessed uh, because possess implies a total control. What we believe is that demons can influence us. Pastor Brown traces the practice of casting out demons back to Jesus. If you read the first account in the Gospel of Mark of an exorcism is when Jesus is in a synagogue, a demonized person, all of a sudden lifts up his voice and says, Aha! We know who you are, the Holy Son of God. Have you come to torture us before our time? And so this man is screaming, but it's not the man, it's the demon. And then Jesus tells the demon to shut up and come out and the man is set free. We believe there are millions, perhaps even billions of, of fallen angels that are working underneath Satan's control. So with so many of them, we do believe we have to be on guard. I say let her go now! Satan doesn't want anybody on this earth to be happy. Come on, she doesn't deserve this. You have no legal right to be in her. He wants everybody to be unhappy, and he wants everybody to be with him in, in hell. You let my sister go now? Come out of her! Because he is very real. He is very, very real. You can't see him, but he is real. Once and for all! Come out! In Jesus' name. Hallelujah! I heard voices evil voices telling me that to do things, to do evil things to my family. And, uh, and I was trying to fight that. Nazarene, he is mine. I believe when people are shaking and talking in voices that the demons are reacting. 
the demons are using their vocal cords and they're screaming out things. I did feel the man physically inside of me to a, to a point that the demon almost made me commit suicide just maybe two or three days ago. That demon told me get get a, get a butcher knife and, and, and stick it in your stomach. There it is, there it is, there it is in Jesus' name. Oh, Jesus! <laughs> I felt alleviated, I felt illuminated, and uh, I felt free from all these uh, evil spirits that were inside of me. Sing it. When it's time for Jesus to come back, he will decide. You are with me, and the others that are not will be cast in the lake of fire. For many Christians, the existence of Satan and some form of hell is self-evident. But there are also other visions of hell. We believe that only a few people are going to receive God's condemnation and God's wrath. For centuries, followers of the world's great religions have grappled with fundamental concepts of heaven and hell. If you look at all the images of the afterlife and you treat all of them with respect, you come to the notion that human beings always believe in an afterlife. So what could it mean? I think people look into the afterlife as if it's a mirror and there they see what's important about themselves. Christianity, Islam, and Judaism have different views on the afterlife. Islam means surrender to Allah's will and contains no figure with the influence of Christianity's devil. However, Christianity and Islam do both believe in the existence of hell. The Quran tells us that hell is a physical and literal place an abode for the sinners. Hell is an essential part of a human, human life. And without hell, this life will be in disarray and disorder. This is why God created the paradise and hell for us to be disciplined, for us to follow the truth. And when it is said unto him, be careful of thy duty to Allah, Pride taketh him to sin. Hell will settle his account, an evil resting place. The Quran, chapter 2, verse 206. Those condemned to the hell of Islam are met in a frightening manner. We read in some of the Quranic passages that when the sinners are being driven towards the hell, it would welcome them with a huge roaring uh, voice. They're going to, to hear the roaring of the fire and uh, the fire is, is deep, narrow, tight. After arriving in Islam's hell, the pain is fierce. Lo, hell lurketh in ambush, a home for the rebellious. They will abide therein for ages. Therein they taste neither coolness nor any drink, save boiling water and paralyzing cold. The Quran, chapter 78, verses 21 through 25. The Quran continues to mention uh, how people are going to be tortured and, and, and receive chastisement there. Uh, their skins will burn, but God would renew uh, their skins so they can taste the, the punishment of the fire. The torture is not one time or twice, it's numerous, it's continuing. Although relentless in its torture, the hell of Islam is not permanent. Punishment may take days, weeks, or years. However, all but the most evil will eventually find their way to paradise. And the Quran implies that a majority of souls will avoid hell entirely. We believe that only a few people are going to receive God's condemnation and God's uh, wrath and therefore few of the people are thrown into the fire. He has to be, in his character, he has to be angry and wrathful. But this is only temporary. We always say that his mercy 
overcomes his wrath and he uses his mercy more than he uses his his wrath but the wrath is needed for people to serve him but not all faiths embrace belief in a physical hell the hebrew bible does not emphasize the afterlife it's not unusual today to find conservative and reformed jews all over the world saying that jews don't believe in an afterlife they believe that the good that one does lives after one one is remembered by one's family uh, that one should do good deeds and attest to the memory of one's forefathers but there's no literal afterlife however according to one of the 13 principles a code of ethics penned by rabbi maimonides in the 12th century and still sung aloud today at synagogues reward and punishment exist after death Maimonides set forth 13 principles of the Jewish faith. One of them is that God judges people and gives to the bad according to his badness and to the good according to his goodness. Literal hell is not a, a big issue in Jewish life, but it doesn't matter. What matters is, does the truly evil person get his just desserts? And the Jewish belief is emphatically yes. Even Orthodox Jews, some who do embrace an afterlife, find it improper to appeal to God for a better station in the next life. The mourner's Kaddish, the prayer recited by those grieving for lost loved ones, does not mention the deceased or ask God to look over them. Rather, it reaffirms the survivor's faith in the Almighty. The Buddhist conception of an afterlife differs considerably from many creator-based religions. The afterlife is not a place, but a state of existence. Hell is a realm where the dead are reborn into anxiety and distress. He sees living beings seared and consumed by birth, old age, sickness, and death. Care and suffering sees them undergo many kinds of pain because of their greed, attachment, and striving. They undergo numerous pains in their present existence, and later they undergo the pain of being reborn in hell as beasts or hungry spirits. Lotus Sutra, Chapter 3. The Wheel of Life offers a visual depiction of the many Buddhist states of being and realms of life. The second circle, half white, half black, represents the afterlife. Those who take the path of light are led to positive rebirths. Those who follow the path of darkness experience negative rebirths, the hells of Buddhism. There is no divine judge to condemn one to hell. Rather, one's own evil karma gives rise to rebirth in this realm. The result of a human soul either ascending or descending is no different than if a person ate spoiled food and became sick. When you become sick on the food, it's not because someone's punishing you. That's just a natural result. That's how the body works. That's how human nature is. They believed in the afterlife the same thing. A soul would either ascend because it was light and beautiful or it would descend under the weight of its own evil. In Chinese Buddhism, there are multiple realms of hell. In these hells, living beings suffer incalculable and indescribable pain. Gnawed by hungry jackals, ravens, black dogs, speckled vultures, and crows, the sufferers groan. Such a state is experienced by the man of unwholesome deeds. It is a state of absolute suffering. Buddhism, Sutta Napada, verses 672 through 676. But as in Islam, the suffering is not eternal. The living beings suffer the pain of hell until the unwholesome karma they have generated in life is exhausted. The hell dwellers, hungry spirits, beasts, and the numerous others who are in difficult circumstances are thus able to be saved. Lotus Sutra, Chapter 24. When their bad karma is exhausted, the occupants of hell are reborn in more fortunate realms of existence. For all their differences, the dominant religions of the world generally agree on a code of human conduct. 
But over time, rebels and dissenters have challenged traditional notions of hell and Satan and adopted the devil as one of their own. Rebels of all stripes have long latched on to the devil's coattails to express disdain for conventional authority. Celebrating the devil is a startling way to oppose all that society holds sacred, a fact that some in rock and roll have exploited. What better way to define itself as being rebellious in a Christian society than to start glorifying hellacious imagery and having bands who took on the persona of demons and devils and who sort of laughed at the idea that, that hell is a bad place. Hell is a place where the partiers go. It's the place of scantily clad women, where the alcohol never stops flowing and the parties go on forever. Throughout history, hell and the devil have served as symbols for the disaffected. America was born in rebellion, and a few of its greatest icons made alliances with the host of hell. In the late 1700s, a group of Englishmen formed the first Hellfire Club, a fraternity dedicated to drinking, sex, and at times, ridiculing Christianity and mocking its sacred rituals. Members met at ruined monasteries to revel in black masses and drunken orgies. An occasional participant was the American ambassador to Great Britain, Benjamin Franklin. A century later, Mark Twain displayed his iconoclasm by celebrating the underworld. But I recall Mark Twain's apt quip, heaven for climate and hell for company. That if you want to meet really interesting people, you don't go to heaven, you go to Dante's hell. Twain's essay, Letters from the Earth, includes fictional missives penned by the devil that expose the egocentric aspect of human nature. He thinks he's the creator's pet. He believes that the creator is proud of him. He even believes the creator loves him, has a passion for him, sits up nights to admire him, yes and watches over him to keep him out of trouble ain't it a quaint idea mark twain letters from the earth writing in the same age as twain british romantic poets embrace the devil as a powerful way of rejecting society william blake said a true poet is of the devil's party and saw the greatest sin as ignoring the impulses of one's own heart as William Blake wrote in the uh, Marriage of Heaven and Hell, you need both the heavenly and the hellish aspects of the world and aspects of the soul to have a full human life. Now this is deeply anti-Christian, this is deeply anti-religious. What the Romantics do is turn art into a kind of substitute for religion. For Blake, hell was a realm of spectators, souls spiritually dead through their lack of creativity. Lo, a shadow of horror is risen in eternity unknown, unprolific, self-closed, all repelling. What demon hath formed this abominable void, the soul-shattering vacuum? William Blake, Book of Urzen. By the 20th century, even many churches had de-emphasized the horrors of hell. The ruler of hell, often absent from the pulpit, found a second career in popular culture. Demonically themed novels and movies drew huge followings. For many children who came of age in the 1950s, one of their first reading experiences came from comic books set in a hellish underworld. Horror comics like Haunt of Fear and Tales from the Crypt grew so popular that Congress investigated the phenomenon. There was a very real fear that children were spending too much time with these undead, otherworldly creatures and that it was poisoning this upcoming generation. There was a very famous German doctor, uh, Verthen, who said these, uh, reading these comic books is absolutely destructive to the psyche. This is going to produce a generation of emotionally ruptured people who are incapable of having decent relationships and of functioning in a society. Today, rebels of all types adopt infernal imagery to outrage defenders of the status quo. One of the reasons that Hell's Angels use that imagery 
is because it makes other people angry. And they want to make other people angry. They want to make other people scared of them. But perhaps no group has ever taken on the trappings of the devil with more enthusiasm than the modern church of Satan. In nomine Satanus, Lucifer excelsis Dei. In the name of our most exalted God, Satan Lucifer, I command thee to come forth. Come forth and bestow these blessings of hell upon us. Hail, Satan! Hail Satan! The Church of Satan has chosen Satan as its primary symbol because in Hebrew it means adversary, opposer, one to accuse or question. And we see ourselves as being the Satans, the adversaries, opposers and accusers of all spiritual belief systems that would try to hamper enjoyment of our life as a human being. Founded in San Francisco, California by Anton LaVey in 1966, the Church of Satan sees belief in God or hell as delusional, and so they choose to practice self-reliance and self-worship. This is a very selfish religion. We believe in greed, we believe in selfishness, we believe in all of the lustful thoughts that motivate man because this is man's natural uh, feeling. If you're going to be a sinner, be the best sinner on the block. If you're going to do something that's uh, naughty, do it and realize that you're doing something naughty and enjoy it. Many of the church's beliefs are spelled out in the Satanic Bible. Behold the promise of Satan and his power, which is called amongst ye a bitter sting. Move and appear, unveil the mysteries of your creation. For I am a servant of the same, your God, the true worshiper of the highest and ineffable king of hell. The Satanic Bible, the 13th key. The main ritual of the Church of Satan is the Black Mass, a highly theatrical rite designed to mock the sacred ceremonies of Christian traditions. The Black Mass exploits imagery of hell and Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Open wide the gates of hell and come forth. We have chosen purposefully to use the word Satan because of its theatrical value. Because we're attracted to the symbol of Satan, we have an approach that enjoys what we would consider a dark side of existence. Recently, History Channel producers were given permission to attend a modern-day Black Mass, an event rarely seen by anyone outside of the Church of Satan. In Satanism, we practice ritual magic. We call the ritual chamber intellectual decompression chamber. It's where we stop rationalizing and thinking. We go inside a, a room that's darkened and lit with candles, and we release our emotions in a way to clear out anything that might be hindering us from pursuing all the kind of things we would like to do. When we perform rituals, we believe that uh, it's necessary to not have distractions. So most of the men and many of the women will wear black hooded robes. It sort of has a wonderful, almost gothic sensibility. Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Following in the tradition of founder Anton LaVey, the modern black mass is sexually charged. Satanism acknowledges the fact that we have love and lust. It's natural to the human animal. So if you're seeking a partner, you might do a lust ritual. Women sometimes will dress in clothing that's sexually stimulating to the men, because as we know, men are very easily visually stimulated. Also a part of the ceremony is the destruction ritual. We do unto others as they do unto us. So if someone harms us, we fully believe that you have the right to avenge yourself against that kind of injustice. So vengeance is part of our philosophy. We have a destruction ritual which is meant to clear away any kind of hatred that might arise in us because someone has wronged us. The mighty voices of my vengeance smash the stillness of the air and stand as monoliths of wrath upon a plane of writhing serpents. Whoever has harmed you, you might make a doll of this individual. You might stick pins or nails into it or rip it into pieces. That will be the heart of what the destruction ritual is, the, the 
elimination of the person who has harmed you. I see your remaining days as nothing but a quiet, tedious collection of hours. You will find no new love. You are lost. Every day will be the same. You may as well have never have lived at all. The beliefs of the Church of Satan put it on the very fringe of the socially acceptable, a fact members savor. We are the adversaries to all the spiritual creeds and all the people who would say, you have to take your cue from somebody else, you have to obey. We create a heaven and hell here in our own existence, and it's completely on our own shoulders as to how it's going to come out. Because Satanists do not accept concepts of an afterlife, they believe they won't be judged by their earthly deeds. However, most in the mainstream of religious practice firmly trust a day of reckoning awaits after death. For them, a haunting question lingers. Just who goes to hell? The history of hell and Satan is long and complex. From biblical teachings to secular imaginings, our fascination with hell and the devil reflect primal fears of death and profound longings for immortality. Ninety some odd percent of us answer yes to the question, do you believe in life after death? But liberals tend to ignore hell. They just don't think it's part of the afterlife, whereas evangelicals and fundamentalists believe in the reality of torment for people who are not like them. For those who do believe in hell, the fundamental question remains, who goes there? We don't really know who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Some Christians, uh, for example, in the, in the Russian Orthodox tradition, nourish the hope uh, that in the end, all people uh, will be saved, uh, including the devil, including Satan. Uh, but that's one of the great mysteries. Uh, it's one of those um, questions that we really don't know the answer to. Even if God's will is unknowable, it seems beyond comprehension for mass murderers like Hitler, Pol Pot, and Jeffrey Dahmer to escape damnation. I can sleep at night only because I do believe that the good get their reward and the, and the bad get their punishment. If you don't believe that there is a hell, then you are saying that Hitler does not have any different fate from Mother Teresa. That the most vile, cruel human being has the same fate as the kindest. The logic of our mind suggests that if God is just, if there's righteousness, if there's some sort of basic fairness in life, then um, there needs to be judgment as well as reward. Even those who agree on a day of judgment differ on what it means to go to hell. It's really not very good theology to say that, that God punishes us, that God sends people to hell. If people go to hell, it's because they have somewhere along uh, in the course of their lives made a decision that they will not, need not, do not have to live in relationship with God. The reality of a final judgment in which there will be a, a parting of the sheep and goats is simply basic Christian truth, Christianity 101. And that implies a hell, but as to what specific content you can give to that, what that means, that's been open to debate since the first century. If you ask me, do you want to believe in hell? I would say, no, I don't want to believe in hell. I want everybody to go to heaven. But to deny hell is to deny God, he said it in the Bible, to deny Jesus, the one who I follow, uh, to deny scripture. Wide is the gate, and broad is the road, that leads to destruction, and many may enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road, that leads to life, and only a few will find it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Fundamentalists read Jesus' words as a sobering reminder that most souls are headed for damnation. 
They believe that anyone who has not accepted Christ as their personal savior is doomed. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is it. On judgment day, the one who's going to be the judge is Jesus Christ. So here's the question. At that point, when you see it's Jesus as the judge, what religion would you wish you were part of? In recent decades, Catholics and many Protestant denominations have revised their interpretations of Scripture in a less restrictive fashion, opening the gates of heaven to a wider audience. Vatican II says very clearly that uh, those who practice the other great religions of the world and even those who have no religion at all but who strive to live according to the graces that God offers to all people can be saved. The great religions of the world do agree that the very essence of hell and the core of its suffering is utter separation from God. And the sacred texts of each faith invite even the most wicked among us to join in redemption. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 7. So it doesn't matter if you're a murderer on death row, it doesn't matter if you've, you've committed multiple murders, if you've stolen, if you've raped, all sin, any sin can be forgiven when you come to the cross and claim the death of Jesus as God's forgiveness for your sin. All faiths hold that on your deathbed, you can repent sincerely and somehow God will forgive you. I am not a big fan of the notion that you can torture children your whole life and then repent a minute before you die. I believe that if you've spent your life doing evil, engaging in cruelty, then you, uh, you will pay the price for it. No matter one's beliefs, humankind faces one inescapable truth. We all will die. But after our loved ones have said their final goodbyes and our earthly bodies are retired, none of us knows our ultimate fate. None of us knows what's on the other side. Robert Frost quote says, the strong are saying nothing until they see. We don't know. Everyone would like a simple answer about hell or the devil or goodness or badness. There is no simple answer to a great deal of life. Most of it happens in shades of gray. But uncertainty does not preclude our constant speculation about hell and Satan. Hell is the ultimate affirmation of free will. And if, if there was no hell, then, then God would ultimately be saying, I don't care what you want, I don't care if you hate me, you're going to be with me forever, so deal with it. But the idea of hell seems to make sense for the souls who say, look, God, I'm sure heaven's really nice, but I don't want any part of it, and I don't want any part of you. Satan could run for office and be elected, which is really troubling. He's very charismatic. He's a natural leader. The problem is, is that he always leads in the wrong direction. And over centuries, the history of Satan and hell seems to be rewritten every generation. Hell is a shared construction project. It's based on stories that have been told by some of the greatest storytellers in the world. Satan is here to stay. The idea of God, man, and the devil will be around for as long as people have longings that they can't realize and things that they fear. A lot of Americans are willing to say that hell is a simple delusion. If you look at the history of hell, you find out it might be a delusion, but there's nothing simple about it. It has an immense, long, important, and very telling history.